Welcome to my world Won't you come on in Hej, mit navn. Det er Stiv Lorenzen og Welcome to my world. I dag har jeg fået besøg af Elvis' sikkerhedschef. Han begyndte at arbejde for Elvis i 1967 og var med ham frem til hans død. Han har også udgivet den her bog omkring hans liv og det her med at tage vare på Elvis. Welcome, Dick. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's my pleasure. My pleasure to be here. I'm having a great time. Is it your first time to run us? No, I've, I've been in, in uh, Denmark. Uh, this is actually the third time I've been to Denmark. Uh, first was in uh, 2007 in Randers. Uh, then I was at, in Copenhagen uh, about three, four years ago. And uh, now today, this weekend, terrific weekend. Okay, do you like staying in on us? I love this. This is a great people. It's a great time. Uh, the weather is much nicer than Las Vegas weather. It's a reasonable, little rainy, but that's good too because we don't get rain in Las Vegas. I guess it's pretty hot most of the time there. It's it's very hot. It's desert area out there. Yeah, but it's again amazing how much green things they have been able to plant out there in the desert. Also, not much, but a little bit. Like so, you have a little bit water and some palms. Well, you you do have palm trees, and in some places we have uh, pine trees like you have here. Yeah, and Las Vegas was one of the places where you went with Elvis, and we are going to talk a little bit about that. Also, uh, have you ever imagined uh, that you, 41 years after Elvis passed away, still would be traveling around talking about him? No, I, and, and there were people when he died that said that Elvis, uh, the big hoopla of uh, Elvis, you know, would die away in a year or two. But here it is, 41 years later, and he's still the, one of the top people in the entertainment business for popularity, for money making, uh, and there's nobody that's been gone that long that's still on everybody's mind and everybody's talking, you know, and listening to his music. It's the funny thing about experts, Steve, it's not always the experts, right? No, I, I tell you, it's, it's the fans, it's the average ordinary citizen that is able to keep Elvis alive, so to speak. And you have been meeting a lot of them. Have you been in many countries talking about Elvis? Yes, I've had, uh, especially here in, in Europe, I've been to uh, the United Kingdom, UK, I've been to uh, actually Sweden, Finland, uh, Denmark, uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, and Germany. So, you know, I've, I've kind of traveled around this area and the fans are stronger and better, really, than most of the U.S. fans. How come? I think it's because Elvis never played over here. Uh, wasn't one of the places, but we were working on that. And uh, the tour that was uh, scheduled when Elvis died that we had to cancel, Right after that tour, uh, five of us were set to come over to actually those countries, uh, the UK, uh, Germany, uh, uh, Paris, Moscow. We were looking for places that Elvis could go and, and play because when he bought that aircraft, uh, the Lisa Marie, that was set up that if we couldn't find the right hotel accommodations and from security and a number of reasons, he could stay on that airplane and we could uh, operate right out of that airplane. But how come uh, you had doubts about security in Europe? I think Europe was maybe a little bit more calmed down than America at that time. Well, it, so you had all the problems with it, it was, but it, you have different regulations over here than they do in the United States. And, uh, you know, one of the things is uh, has to do with working with local police departments. Uh, 
being an ex-policeman, uh, I had a lot of contacts in police departments around the United States. So I could pick up a telephone and call and talk to somebody and get something done. We didn't have those connections here, although a policeman in New York City or Las Vegas it faces the same problems as somebody in Randers or Copenhagen, and they're all brotherhoods. It's a, the, probably the biggest brotherhood around the world, and that's one of the things Elvis loved about, about policemen. Uh, he often talked about it. He wished he'd have gone into police work. I'm glad he didn't, number one, because we wouldn't have a, the music that he did. But Elvis was too kind to everybody. He couldn't stop and f arrest somebody and take him to jail. You know, he, he just, he liked it, people. Yeah, that's a good sign to have also. Uh, going back a little bit before we talk more about Elvis, uh, what made you decide to become a policeman? Was it something where your father a policeman or was it some family thing or why? No, I had gotten out of the service and uh, having been a, a in the Air Force, uh, there wasn't a lot of things that I could do. And I had a, a wife and a young child, and uh, the police department was uh, looking for police cadets. And, uh, you know, one of the things you don't have policemen laid off, they, you know, you don't get rid of policemen, you keep adding to it as our population grows. So it was pretty steady job as long as you didn't catch a bullet somewhere, you know. And uh, I just really enjoyed help because you're helping people one way or another. You know, they may not like the way you help them, but you're, you're protecting them. You know? And uh, where was it you were a policeman? Was that Los Angeles? Or? No, I was a policeman first in uh, Toledo, Ohio. And then I moved to Palm Springs, California, which is where I met Elvis in May 1st of 1967. Also a desert town. I've been in Palm Springs many years ago. Beautiful little town, but also in the middle of the desert. Yes, it, it's, it, it's a desert, you know, so you don't have a lot of snow. I never shoveled snow in, in Palm Springs, and I shoveled a lot of snow in Toledo, Ohio, and the temperature got down way below zero. Was that one of the reasons for you moving to Palm Springs? It, it certainly was, trust me. It's, you, when you having you stand out there and walk a beat on a police detail uh, and it's 15 degrees below zero in Fahrenheit, you know, that you have to wear a heavy coat. So you went to Palm Springs to become policeman. I can also imagine it's a little bit more quieter in Palm Springs than it was in Ohio. Well, it, it was different, you know, Palm Springs was a much smaller town. Uh, they didn't have as many policemen and didn't have as many problems. But you also had a lot of stars there because uh, the movie stars, the, the movie th people had set up in their contracts that stars in their shows and their movies had to be remain within a hundred miles of the studio in case they needed to do reshoots and things like that. And it just so happened that Palm Springs was about 99 miles from where the studios were in Los Angeles. So we had a lot of stars there. And we had a lot of dignitaries coming there, you know. So uh, my job was one of those, was to help take care of dignitaries. So when Elvis got married in Las Vegas and came to Palm Springs for his honeymoon, I drew the detail to keep crowds away. Was that how you met him or? That's exactly how I met him. I was out there, he had gotten married in uh, Las Vegas and came down to Palm Springs and it was a very hot day and I had would normally have been off that day and I was asked if I would take this detail. Uh, and I really didn't want to but it, the lieutenant that was my boss was also the person that signed and approved the reports I wrote. And uh, I thought it would be a good detail to keep him happy. So I was there, I parked out front uh, of his house, 
and here comes Elvis walking down the steps from the front door and he walks up to the police car and police cars in the, as those days didn't have any air conditioning in it and it was uh, over 100 degrees, about 105 degrees in Palm Springs that particular day, very hot day. And I'm in there sweating and uh, because we don't have air conditioning. And Elvis walked up and stuck his hand through the window and said, Hi, I'm Elvis Presley. And it's like, I thought to myself, who is it? He ought to know. I know who he is coming. So I told him, I know, my name's Dick Grove. And he said, I'll bet you're thirsty. Would you like a glass of lemonade? And he handed a glass of lemonade through. I said, thank you very much. And he said, mind if I sit in the police car with you? I said, no, come on, get in. So he got in the car. And we sat there and talked about police work and things because he was always very interested in police people and the things that policemen did. And uh, he said, you know, we, one of the things we talked about was his uh, just recent wedding. He said, you know, I just got married in Las Vegas. And it was after about, a, uh, about an hour and a half. And he said, maybe I ought to go back inside. And I thought, told him, I said, well, you know, they have quickie weddings in Las Vegas, but you can get a real quick divorce in Las Vegas too. And I thought he was nuts because he's in there now sweating just like I am and he's got a brand new beautiful wife and an air-conditioned house that's very cool and he's out here talking to me, you know, and sweating and in the heat. You know. So he got out and he said, if you want any more lemonade, come on up to the house and get some. Well, but, I don't know, an hour and a half or so later, I walked around to the back of the house, which I'd already checked out before I, uh, when I first got details, so I knew what the layout was. And uh, he saw me coming to the kitchen door. He ran over and locked the door and said, come around to the front. And now I'm really not real happy at this point because now I got to walk down this hill I had just climbed up and then go climb up the steps. And he opened the door and he took me in and introduced me to everybody that was there. Priscilla's mother and father, his father, uh, the guys that were with him, his father's wife at that time. And, uh, we sat and talked for a while and finally I said, oh, I better go out and get back to my police car. And he said, well, did you get the lemonade? And I said, no, not yet. So we went into the kitchen and he saw that I got the lemonade. And he walked me to the front door and said, any friend of mine comes in the front door. And that started the friendship that went on for over 10 years. So you saw him again shortly after uh, this first meeting? It was, yeah, I, I remember it very well because it's, it changed, was the start of a change in my life. In what way it was a change? Well, I, right away he wanted me to, to hire me, to go to work for him full time. And I said, no, I like doing police work. And he said, well, I'll pay you more. I said, it's not a matter of pay. I just happen to like what I'm doing. And he kept asking me and asking me and asking me. And finally, he, was, uh, he would have me come in and do a couple of special events. Uh, one of his, uh, he'd have a New Year's Eve party and he'd hire me to come and just be his personal bodyguard, you know. And I didn't really have anything to do, but he wanted me there. And uh, finally, he said uh, he was uh, going to go and start touring and traveling around. And he said, I'd like you to at least come on the tours with me and set stuff up. And I said, well, you'll have to talk to the chief. You know, uh, I was surprised because I knew Elvis didn't get up early in the morning. I mean, he slept most of the day and he was out at night if he was doing things. And uh, that particular morning, I walk into the police department at 8 o'clock. Elvis is already sitting there waiting for the chief to come in. He comes in and he talks to the chief and he spends about 45 minutes talking to the chief. And he comes out and he gives me a thumbs up and walks right out the door. Well, about 30 minutes later, I get called into the chief's office and I thought, uh oh, I'm in big trouble now, you know, because you didn't want to go to the chief's office. And the uh, chief said, 
I just talked with Mr. Presley, he would like you to go. If you can set up your time off while you're gone, uh, you can go. So after at that point then, I, I would either take my vacation time or extra time off, because they didn't pay you overtime, you got time off uh, for a working extra hours, and went off on his tours. And that went on for several tours, and finally he said, ask me again to go to work for him, and I kind of liked what I was doing for him, said, okay, let's go. So you got into the show business, and so the other sides of show business also by working for Elvis Presley. But he never looked back and missed your police work in those years when you started working more full-time for him? Well, yes, I did. Uh, and, and to this day, I still miss that kind of, but it was an opportunity that uh, it changed my life because uh, being in that business, I was still doing police business, taking care of Elvis Presley. I, I had taken care of some other very important dignitaries when they were visiting Palm Springs or that area. And uh, working, you know, police work, is never the same. It's always different. You never know what's going to happen from minute to minute. Is and every day is different. Well, being with Elvis sometimes was that same way because Elvis liked to do things on the spur of the moment, and uh, you didn't have a plan for that. He'd just say, "We're going to fly here," you know, and so you had to set all that stuff up. So it was just almost like being in a policeman. And I still had the good contacts that I had made in police work in different cities. And so I'd call up certain people that I knew in a particular city and tell them we're coming into town and needed this kind of help. That, and they were all ready to give it to me. Fantastic. Just one question before we want to talk about the security work for Elvis. You talked a little bit about it actually. It feels like a very unique impression, first impression you must have got of Elvis Presley coming out that way just down toward handing you and some lemonade you know and inviting you to the house um, but if you can put some words to how you felt he was as a human when you uh, met him first time but also did he stay the same all the years being same kindly person all the time or did you also got to see other sides of him? Well, yeah, you, you know, what you're, what you're saying is absolutely true about Elvis. Uh, I wasn't particularly impressed with Elvis. Uh, when I was growing up and listening to music, I'm not the one that put the money in the jukebox to play Elvis songs. Uh, I never was into music. So, uh, and I had met a lot of other people, you know, Steve McQueen, uh, Arnold Palmer, uh, presidents, uh, dictators, uh, that kind of people. So uh, Elvis being who he was was not really special and that's probably why I didn't first take the job with him. Uh, but as I got to know him, uh, he was in addition and this is what a lot of people don't know about Elvis. He's a great entertainer, the best in the world. There's not going to ever be another Elvis Presley. But he was also a uh, individual, a human being, that uh, put his pants on like you and I do, one leg at a time. You know, he wasn't up on any pedestal. Uh, he was very common, very ordinary. He loved people. He was very giving. Uh, he would uh, see somebody that, well, and this was later on in the concert years, but somebody would get injured at one of his shows. And one of my jobs was to find out how bad they were injured if they were taken off to a hospital or something. And Elvis would pay for the hospital. Uh, he just wanted to give. He just, uh, you know, and that stayed. Uh, I just got to know it where I didn't know it the first. He was just an ordinary person that was special, but I had dealt with special people for 
several years already, so that didn't impress me. You know? But he never really, he liked to be in control, uh, but he never really was the kind of person that demanded things. You know, he, you wanted to do things for Elvis, and his fans did, simply because he was Elvis, not because he demanded it. You know, uh, he would take good care of people and go out of his way to help people, especially different charities. You know, he gave money to police departments. Uh, when we'd travel around, I would know if a policeman had been shot or killed or something in a particular city, and I would tell Elvis, you know, that maybe we'd been to that city before and we knew the people, uh, maybe we hadn't, but it didn't matter to him. A policeman, he would go out after the show, after all the people who were visiting him had left before he went to bed, he'd go out and sit and talk to the policeman in the hallway, pull up a chair, and ask, you know, did this particular officer have a family? Were they married? This, you know, and how was his wife or his widow and his children, perhaps, doing? And, to, and then he'd call one of the guys, usually Charlie Hodge, go get the checkbook. And he'd write a check for $5,000, $10,000 to give to that widow, the, the injured officer or deceased officer. Uh, he just cared about people. And that never changed. Elvis's fans were probably his number one love in life. And probably also that's what people could feel about him, that he has this big love uh, for other people, you know. It was maybe part of his charisma because he had this fantastic charisma. Also when he was singing very bad songs, the songs became much better just for him singing it compared to others that will be totally failure. I still think some of the songs are not so good, but... Hey, well, you're, you're right there too, you know, the, the fans you could feel this, in because I was in every concert that he did, and you could feel the charisma and the power that Elvis sent out to his fans, and you could feel the fans sending that power back to Elvis. And it was a, a thing going on in music business that it didn't matter what Elvis did, whether it was a good song or bad. Some of the songs that he sang, he wasn't real happy with, especially the movie songs that were given to him. He wasn't real happy with those. Uh, but others, he picked out, and nobody told Elvis how to sing a song. Elvis came up with that in his own mind. There was nobody that would tell Elvis. And nobody would tell Elvis what to sing. They may suggest that he sang it for particular reasons or something, but nobody did. Elvis made the final decision. And every one of his shows, there were only two songs that were fixed. The very first one when he came on, and the last one that he would sing, where he was telling me, I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to leave. I'm done. You know, and this. We set everything up to move at that time because he was going to be done. Uh, but Elvis just, he put things into songs from his heart. He just didn't sing. You know, there are singers that go out there and they have a mental thing, the words, and that's it. But Elvis sang from his heart. And you can tell he really enjoys it, especially his gospel music. You know, uh, when Elvis sings How Great Thou Art, you know he's only talking to one person, and that's God. And whether it's a God or whatever you call it, you know, because we all call him heaven and that by different names depending on our religion. But Elvis hated to be called the king, did not like that at all. In his mind, there was only one king, and that's man up above that takes care of us all or takes us away in life, whatever it is. That was the only thing that Elvis thought of as king, not him. 
And going back a little bit to the shows where you had to take care of the security, first I have to ask the question, Ellis had some guys around him, friends from old days, uh, taking care of security for him, Red West, Sunny West, um, and so on. Uh, when you came in, was it easy to get into that group and be a part of the security when you first started out? We all became close friends, and uh, yes, they had been there for many years, and I brought, because things had changed. Uh, when the, the Sonny and Red and, and those people were uh, doing things, the shows weren't, you know, they weren't playing 20,000 seat arenas. You know, we may have different, small, much smaller places. Uh, sometimes they would go in, they didn't leave, they'd go in the dressing room after the show. And uh, sometimes they had to call policemen to get him out of there because women loved Elvis. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was one of those things, and guys, you know, they, they'd hang around and try to get autographs and, and so forth and so on. And unfortunately, one of the big problems we always had was uh, women have a dangerous weapon with them, their fingernails, and they'd try to touch him and you could see uh, in some pictures for us, you can see band-aids all over the top of his hands. And that was simply because they would scratch him and this would get infected. So you had to be careful with that. Women were just dangerous, totally dangerous. You know? <laughs> Not because they really wanted to hurt him, but they wanted to touch him, to be close to him. You know? And uh, that was probably one of the biggest, was crowd control. And you get 50 women all wanting to get on stage or close to the stage, you got a real problem. You better have 120 policemen there to keep the 50 women away because women can be really rough. Was you involved with the decision that he should leave while people were still applauding after Kane Hill falling in love or the last song that he was almost in the limo to get out there? And did that have something to do with that it was easier to drive away from the venue before everybody started to get into the cars? Or what was the reason for him leaving so fast? Many other artists maybe stay in the venue an hour on before they go on. Well, yeah, it was, I, I was involved in making that decision and it just became a, a numbers game. Uh, you're now playing for, well, like the Atlanta Omni had 20,000 people there. Uh, they will flood out of an arena real quick. And if you keep them there for 20 seconds or 30 seconds when they're saying, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis has left the building and thank you and good night, you know. Uh, we, I set up, uh, and this is one of the things I learned from working with other details, uh, the Israeli Mossad, I worked with them, uh, the U.S. Secret Service, uh, uh, the people from uh, the United Kingdom that uh, brought Prince Philip over to uh, the U.S. And so I learned some of these little things and <clears throat> you, you go after the stage, after the show, and you go into a room, uh, you can get, and this is something that they remembered from the early days, you can get somewhat locked into that area, you can't get out because the crowds will hang around and hang around and hang around. So I set up a thing that we, we basically tried to be, my timetable was from the time Elvis stepped off that stage, 45 seconds we were out the building in the car going. And that then gave you time ahead of the other crowd getting out, but it also gave you time to get away from the motor vehicles that might try to follow you and you have possibility of accidents when that happens because people drive crazy, they're nuts, you know, they just want to be close to Elvis. And it gave us time to get where we were going, either back to a hotel or to the airport or whatever, uh, 
before he, a big crowd started following him. And Elvis would draw a crowd, it didn't matter where he was. He couldn't walk around uh, during the daytime because people would follow him. And, and again, now then you start getting crowds that people are pushing each other to try to get closer to Elvis. So you're, you're creating a secondary problem area is people hurting each other uh, plus what may have happened may happen to Elvis. So you try to control that and you eliminate those things. Uh, it doesn't do any good as a security person to go up and have to hit somebody. Uh, because that's, not, the, 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 that's a, yeah the, the, you should be able to predict where these problems and you avoid those problem areas and that was one of the reasons getting Elvis out you know and moving him because he didn't like being locked in and having to have the police department come and move the crowds away that he had in the early 50s when he was he wasn't any more popular, but things changed a bit because he was now playing for bigger crowds in, in that. You know. When Ellis uh, left the building in his car, were you one of them following him in the car or did you stay to take care of things there uh, so everything was being emptied nicely with the audience before you went after Elvis? And did you go before Elvis to the next town or did you stay with Elvis? Well, we always went to we'd plan a tour and uh, two to three weeks before the tour we would go and check every building everything in that particular towns on the tour uh, just to see what the problems were what's the best way in and out of a hotel what's the best way in and out of the arena uh, how long did it take you to get from the hotel to the arena and I'd make notes of Okay, it's a 12-minute drive normally, you know, uh, from the hotel to the arena, and you come in the back door of the arena, and Elvis will go on a five-foot stage, you know, and uh, he goes on from stage right, and this particular he leaves on stage left because the limousine has been moved or stuff. And I always rode with Elvis in the limousine to and from the place. And if we were going to perhaps the airport to fly to the next city, we already had one of our people in the next city setting everything up at the hotel there. So, uh, and sometimes I would be that person, sometimes Sam Thompson would be, or Red West, or, you know, uh, Sonny. So we always had somebody setting up in the next city. But then, when we got to that next city, before the show, I would go back and rerun everything that we did just to make sure there was no <clears throat> street closings or uh, barricades for, you know, a hole in the ground or anything. And what other ways were there to get to the arena and what times that may change from 14 minutes to 22 minutes because we had to move Elvis at that uh, on that timetable. Elvis did not like to go into an arena uh, very early so we always tried to get him there during the intermission time and as little time where he'd have to stay in the dressing room backstage as possible because although Elvis had done all these shows his life, every show that he went to, he was nervous before he went on stage. And the longer time he had to sit in a backstage area, uh, he started pacing just like a tiger, yeah, very nervous, very upset until he could get so get on stage and once he was on stage he was in command you know, but it, it he never knew Elvis never knew how great he was and he would often ask and, and 
talking, you know, in personal time. We were very close friends. He'd say, Dick, do you think people will ever remember me? <laughs> I'd say, Elvis, you don't know how long they're going to remember you. And you can see that. This is now 41 years, and he is still top dog. And in fact, you know, uh, Michael Jackson was another one that I had done security for a long time after Elvis died, but uh, he's been gone just a few years, and you hardly hear about Michael Jackson anymore. You know, uh, Prince is another one. You know, he was big time and a big. But you don't hear a lot of it. Elvis is still on today. You hear his name on television and in, in movies. They, you know, refer to Elvis this and that way. So he's not going away very soon. And there are now no longer just the fans that were there when he was alive and my, but young kids are still growing up now. Their parents or grandparents were fans of Elvis. These kids are now fans of Elvis, and they can tell you every word on songs and things like that. So it's a, it's not going to ever change in, in my lifetime and probably your lifetime. You know, it'll still be Elvis Presley number one in the world. Do you think he believed you when you told him that he'll be remembered for a long time, or was he so insecure that he next day had the same feelings? You know, okay. I, 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 that's difficult to answer. I can't really say. I think, yes, he believed me. But then again, you know, uh, things change and, and your inner feelings change. You may feel good today, but tomorrow you think, you know, uh, am I going to be good at work today? You know, I mean, those kind of things work on you. And uh, it would depend because there were places that we'd go and play and we'd get the newspaper the next day and the sports writer would say uh, the Elvis Presley show was terrible and right and when you're there you know when the, the Elvis never did a terrible show some for different reasons you know there some of them were not as good as others but uh, most of these people that wrote that kind of stuff were mad and upset because they didn't get free tickets. We didn't give away free tickets. You know, it, it's like, okay, you want to come and see the Elvis show? Buy a ticket. Because that ticket was usually went to some good function, you know, uh, uh, and we didn't believe in giving away free tickets to get things, you know, a good sponsor or a good review. So yeah, Elvis would read these and you know, he'd say, or maybe something was wrong. There were some cities that you had a bad sound system. And that was one of the most important things in Elvis's career was the sound. Uh, he hated playing the Houston Astrodome because it's an open arena. And you can't put a sound system in an open arena that is very good for everybody. And Elvis wanted his fans to have the best sound from him, the sound system, the place we were playing, and that. So those were all things that were considered when I, you know, and I, I'm not into music, but I, I can tell you that Elvis was very concerned about that. There were places that the sound was so bad Elvis said, we're in this car going back to the hotel. He said, Dick, see how many, how we can give everybody back their money. And we'd have a new sound system at the next city. You know? uh, and it, you know, you, you have to tell Elvis, you know, we can do miracles with Elvis, but you can't give away, give back everybody their money because there will be people out there that will print tickets overnight if you say you're going to do that, you know, and you maybe have a 10,000 uh, tickets sold and you'll have 15,000 people trying to bring tickets in. Although Elvis's ticket prices were not expensive in comparison to other people at 
that were present in, in singing and performing at that time. Uh, Tom Jones, uh, Humbert Inc., uh, you know, those people were selling tickets for uh, $35, $40 a ticket. Elvis, we had just got him to increase his price from $15 a ticket to $17.50 for the tour that never happened. Wasn't it also the colonel who wanted to keep the prices down, down so everybody could afford coming in? There was one question and the next question just following afterwards you can then say is also, I think also in the beginning that you, you used the sound system from the halls for hockey halls, you know, which was not made for music because the colonel thought that was maybe good enough. <laughs> or what was the what was the story behind that? Well, I, that I can't tell you. I, you know, I, you worked with the sound system that you had available. And we brought in, we had a sound company that had two different trucks loaded with all the stuff and uh, one truck would go to, let's say, the first city we'd be playing, Buffalo, New York, just as an example. Uh, one truck would go to Buffalo, New York. The next city might be Mobile, Alabama. Well, the second truck went down to Mobile, so, and that leapfrogging happened all the way along. And uh, people would go in, and you tried to work with the sound system that was in an arena. Arenas were not symphony-driven places. They were basketball, football, rodeo, whatever it was. So they didn't really care about the quality of the sound, but can we put out the name of the winner or this, you know, uh, what bull is being ridden that particular, and who the rider, you know, those kind of things. So you tried to match up that sound system with what Elvis wanted, and we would hang all kinds of different uh, sound pieces of equipment and that uh, in di different locations in it, and they would be tested out to try to provide the best sound system possible. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, and I knew the Colonel well, I never knew the Colonel to say, cut down on the sound system to keep expenses low or something. That was, that was not part of the, the deal, you know, and it never happened. Uh, and if Elvis, uh, I know that uh, we played uh, Saginaw, Michigan, and for some reason the sound system was just terrible. And that was one of the places that Elvis said, Dick, see if we can get money back, you know, and I finally convinced him that it just was not something that security could do or anybody could do. And the next time we, we played Saginaw, which was about two or three days later, we went back to the same place, which we did sometimes. Uh, they had a different sound system in there, and it was 100% Better. Elvis loved it. When Elvis was on stage, I guess it was most his monitor sound he could hear when he was walking on stage. But did you and the other guys tell me about how was the sound uh, tonight, or how did he get knowledge of the sound in the in the hall where the audience was sitting? He really didn't, uh, unless we were there early or. When they started 2001 to bring him on, um, he obviously could hear that that sound. But uh, there was a, a gentleman from Australia named uh, Bruce Jackson, uh, who and Felton Jarvis, who were there because there were really two systems in it. One was the main house system, and the technician on there at the end, last few years was a man by the name of Bill Porter and Bill would be out there and they would do sound checks while they were setting this stuff up in the daytime and the other system was the actual stage system which uh, you saw all the, the amplifiers that were on the stage and that and they were sitting off the side of the stage and they were controlling the sound that the people on the stage heard, which let them work together 
in what they were doing, and Elvis heard that system. So uh, Elvis had no way of knowing what was going on out in the main hall. Uh, but it's like I would walk out there. Everybody, there were other people who walked out there, and when we got in the car, Elvis would say, "You know, how was the how was the sound? How was the show?" It was always one of the first things out of his mouth when he came off stage. Uh, was it a good show, or you know, this and that, and uh, because he wanted to know. And he always got the honest opinion from Joe and you and the other guys. So we always think about, oh, we don't want him to get in a bad mood because of a bad something. Well, I can't say everybody gave him an honest opinion. There were people that would uh, give him an answer that they know he wanted. Uh, there were other of us that he would ask, and we knew if he was asking those people, he wanted an honest opinion. And we'd say, well, yeah, it, it was a little flat out there, or it was a little hard out there, or a little too loud or soft or stuff like that. And he would look into that. You know, nothing was ever told to him deliberately that I'm aware of to keep him from getting upset because it was bad. Because uh, with the number of people that were around, not only in the colonel staff and uh, the band people and, and Elvis's staff, somebody's going to tell him if it's really bad. So you told him the straight out truth, and he appreciated that because. Uh, he'd adjust to it, you know. You, and Elvis himself could tell what was going on because he could read the audience from applause and screams and hollers and the way people moved around. Uh, we went to uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, which is a Mormon religious area, uh, and they're a little different than other religions and things. And uh, when he started the show, uh, there were a lot of people dressed up in tuxes and ladies in evening gowns and that. And they just sat there and very politely clapped. There was no screaming, no hollering, no people jumping up and down. So I was kind of changed. And, and as I said before, there were only two songs set first and the last, the rest he could change what he wanted to do. So he changed and, you know, and he maybe sang some country, just straight applause. And you could see him as he went through the regular number of songs that he did, you could see him working and, and he wasn't going to let this audience put him down. He was going to be in control of this audience. And, about three quarters of the show, normally, you know, it'd be an hour show, long, you know, about three quarters of the show was this just polite applause. And he just kind of stopped and he took a couple of sips of water on the stage and you could see he was going to have this. He came out and went into How Great the Art and he blasted that out. And the Mormons were very religious. Obviously, that got their attention. All of a sudden, this audience started screaming and hollering. And the women were rushing the stage and all of this. And Elvis knew, you could see it going on in his mind from his face and everything. He knew he owned them now. And the rest of the show, and he added, instead of an hour, we went something like an hour and a half on the show. The rest of the show was gospel. And he had these people screaming. They were running from up the second floor. I, you know. But when he left that building, he knew he owned everybody in that building. And you could tell he was just as happy as could be. You know? Also being in desperate situations, thinking, what's wrong? Why don't they clap a little bit more like normal? 
and then he actually go in and win them. It must be a very big satisfaction. It, it, it was. He we he talked about that. We all talked about it because you know sitting off on the side and watching things like I did. And I'm not a musical person. I'm not. I don't know. I can't carry rhythm or anything like that. You know. I took care of security, but I could sit there and watch these people, and it's like we're gonna have no security problem with these idiots. You know, they don't know what they're missing. And towards the end, it's like I'm watching my police officers that are there, <laughs> hoping that they can control this crowd and that they're good enough to handle it. You know, uh, and it was just amazing to see this total turnaround in this very dignified audience and when when we went out of that building they were still screaming and hollering. It's fantastic. I cannot remember who told me this story. It's many years ago so maybe I don't have it completely correct but it's the same like you're telling me that Elvis really wanted to see that people enjoyed his show and there was one time I think where he had some people sitting behind the stage also and a person told me that he Maybe it was George Bosidio, it was George Bosidio who told me, so I'm not sure, but that they had the blind people sitting behind. Colonel had been inviting some people from blind school, something like that, but nobody told Ellis about Do you remember anything about that? Is it true, yeah. the story? It's, the story is very true. Uh, it's the way arenas are set up, sometimes you have what they call blind areas, and in this particular area, uh, we had a very high stage and uh, of course you had the band behind with about 30, 35 people behind the stage uh, with the band and they were up on tiers and kind of went up. So you had a big blind area behind there that couldn't see the stage or Elvis Frey. Well you can't, s you can't sell those tickets, you know, uh, and they're dead. So normally you block them off, but this particular, and I don't remember the city, this particular city had a very large a kind of a university for blind people. And uh, the colonel heard about it. Well, he gives them tickets. Now these are throwaway, you know, normally dead tickets, you can't sell them or anything, but because he gave them away, it's a tax write-off because he's given, you know, I don't know how many thousands of dollars worth of tickets were in there. But, and we knew about it, but one of the things that I did was I would, just before Elvis would go on stage, I'd tell him, either at the hotel or right after we got to the arena, I'd say, you know what, well, you have a five foot stage, so kind of watch when you're out there, you know, where it's only a three foot stage, so, don't get up to the front and lean over because you're liable to get pulled off and that kind of thing. Now, I forgot about the blind thing because we didn't have those every show, you know. So Elvis gets up, goes on stage, does his opening numbers and things, and he walks around to one side, to the back, which he always did to because he knows people are back there, and he sees these people just applauding and jumping and everything. And he throws a scarf up in the air, and it just flutters down to the floor. Nobody's grabbing, reaching for it, right? He doesn't know, yeah, there's, they can hear, so they can get into the rhythm of things, they just can't see the scarf out there, you know? And he looks around, he throws another one there, and it goes down, and now you can see this, what's happening look on his face, you know? And he, and my, pants tore or anything, you know, it, 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 he walks around to the other side and he gets that same reaction, you know, in the back. And two flags, scarves go down. Now the policemen in the back, they're picking up the scarves. They're taking them home to their wives, you know. And they, these blind kids are just hopping because they don't even know Elvis is there in front of them, you know. And uh, we finally got word up, you know, and, and Elvis is, he got word up to Charlie Hodge, and Charlie passed it on to Elvis. And Elvis, you could see this, oh, thank God, look on his face came over. 
And I heard about it for two days from Elvis. Hey, you got another plan for me, Dick? Uh, you know, you, something else you're not going to tell me? You know. So uh, we laughed about. It. But we joked about stuff like that. You know. So. When Elvis stayed at the hotel, did you also stay at the same hotel uh, with him? And was it like he had the hotel room for himself, or did you need to have security people in his room also, or could they just be placed outside his suite? No, they were. Uh, we would check each one of these hotels out and there were some times we usually stayed at the Hilton hotels but there were other times because of the, they didn't have a big suite room or something like that we would stay at others like Radisson or Marriott you know uh, not very often but we did uh, but he, sometimes we had two hotels and it just depended on the number of rooms that were available. Uh, we would put the band and the other musicians in another hotel because the one we had didn't have rooms available or they were booked or something. But we always had uh, our security people and, and the group that was traveling with Elvis uh, as uh, part of his group which could be anywhere from 12 people to 18 people if he would have uh, certain people traveling extra. Uh, George Klein may not, who didn't travel every one of us, but he may go along with on a particular tour. Uh, there may be uh, people with, with girlfriends that were, uh, you know, that kind of thing also. So, I, Security basically stayed on the same floor as Elvis. We also then had police officers at the elevators so that nobody could get off the elevator floor. We also had to be careful in the way we secured doorways at the end of the halls, like fire exits. Uh, by law, you can't lock those fire exits. And also, by ordinance, the way that they make you build these things, those doors have to open outward onto the steps as opposed to inward. So that if there's a fire, you can just push that door and go out. Well, people would climb the stairwells and they'd pull these doors open. So we came up with a way that you could lock it without locking it. And that was the group or the security person that was in the city ahead before we got there uh, would get, if there was a door on either end of the hall, uh, would get two brooms and two sheets from housekeeping. And we'd tie the sheet around the doorknob and then tie it to the broom and you put the broom across the door. Now, if anybody pulled it, from the outside, it would break the broom, which is going to make a noise that's going to alert the police officers that are sitting by the elevator so they can run and stop anybody from coming in. But if there's a fire, all you got to do is twist the broom over and go out the door. So we did those kind of things at it, you know, uh, because you, it was extra expensive if you had to set somebody at each door, you know, and you didn't just didn't need to do that. Uh, so uh, in Las Vegas, sometimes this part of the security would be uh, on the floor right below Elvis because the main suite in Las Vegas Hilton there uh, only had three bedrooms besides Elvis's. So usually Joe Esposito and Sonny or somebody else stayed in those three bedrooms and then Elvis's main bedroom was there. Everybody else was one floor down. But there was always a policeman outside the door. We never put policemen in the same, in Elvis's suite. But you also had to protect him from himself sometimes because Elvis was known as a sleepwalker, you know, walking in his sleep. Did you ever experience anything of that? Uh, I have read in some books that he was walking in his sleep and sometimes he could end up places where he didn't know he was because he was 
Well, that never happened to me, uh, and it never happened on uh, on tour uh, because although we didn't have policemen in these rooms, there was usually <clears throat> one of his valets was in that suite at all times, and the valets. These were young kids, uh, most of them 18, 19 years old. Uh, his step brothers, uh, Ricky and David Stanley and Billy Stanley, um, worked to take care of Elvis getting his clothes laid out and ordering his food and stuff. They worked in kind of a unique system. They worked. 24 hours on a schedule and then the next two days if there were three of them on a tour basically the next two days they were off they only had to be there to get Elvis ready to go in so there was always somebody in the suite that if Elvis got up and started doing that sleepwalking uh, they were there to stop him, and he never got out. Now, most of that that I'm told about <clears throat> happened when he was uh, just before he got into the army and after he got in, uh, after he left the army. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it, it had basically ceased uh, after he, especially after he got married, because. Uh, you know, he had Priscilla with him or some other woman after he and Priscilla split, you know, uh, they were in there. But we always, even at Graceland, uh, the valets had the same schedule at Graceland. They could sleep, but they had to be there in case Elvis needed anything. And if Elvis got up and started moving around sleepwalking, they would be. Right away, yeah. yeah, take yeah. care of it. So it, it never it never got out. The biggest problem was Elvis liked to sneak out and see if he could fool people. Did he do that? Oh yeah, he did that. He did that in Palm Springs one time, and uh, he snuck out. When people weren't paying attention, you know, he he was clever. He was clever, and he could move fast. He got down into the garage, got a motorcycle, fired it up. And, by the time everybody heard that, <clears throat> he was gone down the road. And he'd like to ride around, especially Palm Springs was a smaller town, you know, but he did it in Memphis, he did it in uh, Los Angeles and that. And uh, <clears throat> he went down the center of town and I get a call from the police department. They said, Dick, uh, we think Elvis is sitting by the side of the road down here on the main road that went to the airport. And he's on a motorcycle. I said, yeah, he's he slipped away from everybody here. He said, well, we think he's out of gas. Now, you want us to go by, because police cars, we carried extra gas there. He said, Should we have one of our units go by and give him some gas? I said, no, let him sit there for a while. So, well, uh, we then knew where he was and everything, and the policemen were watching him and, and that seated nobody. But he had this leather jacket on and leather pants, and you know when he was going down the road, nobody knew it was Elvis Presley because of the helmet. And that. But it was warm, and this happened to be daylight, really, it wasn't darkness. So uh, we all get in our car and we drive by and toot our horn and say, let's wave at him and sitting on the side of the road and go on down the road and come back around and did it again, you know. And uh, then we disappeared for about five minutes and he, you could tell he's just exasperated because he can't. And he's got no money in his pocket, never carried money. He couldn't go to a phone call, you know, and put dime in or a quarter in, uh, you know, and uh, he, he just, so we finally go up there and boy, he was mad at the people that were supposed to take care of the motorcycles and cars. They were always supposed to be gassed and everything, you know. Yeah. He, he made James Colley, it was his thing to do, uh, the 
take care of the vehicles that was part of his assignment. And Elvis said, I don't know how you're going to go, but there's a gas station about two miles down. You can probably push the bike down there and then ride it home. You know? And that's, we put Elvis in a car, then it took him back to the house. You know, and I got on him. I said, Elvis, you can't do that. You know, you get out there, you can get hurt. So I mean, nobody's going to know. But he liked that freedom, maybe just being able to ride a little. He'd, he'd do that every once in a while. He'd do that kind of thing, you know. And I think he would just played with some of it was just to play with his security team, you know, uh, because you know he'd say, uh, "Let's let's go to uh, I, I want to go to Nashville to record." So we'd set up. He'd pick dates and times and. We'd set up security there in Nashville, and we'd get airborne. And uh, this was after he had had the Lisa Marie, the Convair 880 uh, airplane. And we'd get airborne, and he'd say, nah, I want to go to Las Vegas, because he'd have maybe a new girl with him or something. So now you got to cancel everything you set up in Nashville get everything set up in Las Vegas. And the Hilton, you know, you'd, you'd call them, and they'd move whoever was in the suite out so that Elvis could have the suite at the top. And we'd get there, the suite, and Elvis would be there about two hours, and he'd say, hey, let's go to Palm Springs. I want to show so-and-so Palm Springs, the girl he was with. So now you got to shut everything down one place and get everything going in another place, you know. And he, he'd finally he'd say, "Okay, you guys, I can't put it over on you today." It was a little game I think we played with each other back and forth. You know? I think Pierre Caline. Do you remember Pete? Pete Pierre Caline, who played uh, in the Voice. So I think it was Voice. He many, many years told me a story about Elvis being in Las Vegas where he also disappeared and he should have been uh, tum putting up thumbs to get back to the hotel because he didn't know where he was or whatever, you know. Have I, you ever heard that story? That I've, I've heard on? something about I don't remember who was involved, but I think it was when Elvis was first in Vegas and was playing at the front, the old Frontier Hotel, which was before my time involved in it. Uh, and actually, it, it was kind of a dismal uh, play performance of Elvis. He wasn't popular at that time, and uh, not like he became, but he was still undergoing uh, the shake, rattle, and roll routine where, you know, police are saying, if you wiggle your hips, we're going to arrest you. And, and, uh, uh, Frontier at that time was uh, a, a casino hotel that uh, most of the patrons there were the elderly, you know, the, the older. All the French and natural. Yeah, that, that, and Elvis was not popular, so it really was a very short engagement. And it wasn't until the Colonel set up the thing at the new international that was being built that Elvis even agreed to go back, but he would go out and do what some of the things I've heard from some of the old people and people in Las Vegas, uh, like he would go to the Sahara Hotel, although he wasn't staying at the Sahara, you know, and things like that. So that may have been, uh, but I don't know of anybody that uh, him doing any thumbing, you know. Uh, there were things that happened. He uh, had a sore throat because what they call Vegas throat, because uh, singers and entertainers get a very dry throat because it's so dry and hot out there. And uh, Dean Nicopolis was the the uh, valet that had the duty and was there, and Elvis had him call the throat doctor that we knew there. And the doctor said, yeah, I'll meet you over at my office. Well, Elvis just, bingo, he's dressed, and he and Dean start down the elevator. Nobody knows he's going to this thing. 
and I ran into Dean. I was down just walking around the floor, and I see Dean and Elvis, were, and I run over there and I, what's going on? He said, Elvis wants to go to the throat. So we go out to the front, <clears throat> the ballets, the limo isn't available, it's gone. The hotel limo. It's like, okay, what do we do now? Some guy pulls up in his Cadillac, gets out, hands his keys to the valet, goes in and to gamble. Valet gives us the keys to the Cadillac. Elvis gets in it, we drive him to the throat doctor, trade him, bring the Cadillac back, give the keys to the valet. This guy that owned the Cadillac never had an idea Elvis rode in his car. <laughs> Amazing. We always made little things like that happen, you know. Another thing is when the tours was over, he went back to Graceland most of the time, I guess. He didn't need so much security at Graceland. There was his family at the, at the gate. Did you go doing something else, or were you staying with him at the Graceland when he, when he was home in Memphis? Well, no, I, I, would, I would lived in Memphis at that time. I didn't live at Graceland. Uh, Elvis wanted me to, he was had three big uh, house trailers on the property uh, that were by other people that were living there, and uh, said he'd give me a house trailer, and I said, I knew at that time that Elvis, when he would go to bed, if he was sleeping at night, uh, he may wake up and he'd go over and want to talk. Well, Billy Smith, when his family was in one of the trailer, uh, his aunt uh, Nash and her husband Pritchard were living in another trailer, and Tish Henley and, and uh, Tommy, her husband, lived in the other trailer. Well, Elvis especially was very close to Billy and Joe Smith uh, and their family. He'd go in there and he'd, he, they weren't locked, the doors weren't locked. So he'd go in and wake him up, sit down in the bed and be talking to Billy about something or other, you know, or whatever was bothering him. And I thought, I don't want this happening to me. I don't like to be woke up at three in the morning if I'm asleep, you know. So I told Elvis, I said, well, Elvis, I said, you have this dog, Gitlo, and uh, I have a German Shepherd that I have trained, and my German Shepherd is not going to like Gitlo at all, and I think it's probably better if we keep them separate. Elvis said, yeah, you Dick, you're probably right. So I had a house about 15 minutes away from Graceland, you know. Uh, just for those reasons, you know, I wanted to be sleep. Yeah. He, he sold Billy as a son, I think, in many ways. And I remember Billy and Joe telling a story about that actually sometimes they could wake up and Elvis was sitting in the bed watching them and waiting for them to wake up so he could talk with them. That was exactly what I'm talking about, yeah? because. Elvis, you know, he was a big man, but uh, because of his karate and that, he could move very quietly and very quickly if he had to. You know? And yeah, that was a common thing for Billy and so, you know, Elvis would just be sitting there waiting for them to wake up and, you know, you, you, when those things happen, you you know something and all of a sudden you wake up and there's Elvis, you know, and it's like, I, you know, you guys want to talk? I yeah. just have another brilliant idea I want to talk with you about. And Billy always said, the best idea is, I like the idea, but the best idea is you. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I, I didn't want to disappoint, you know, but I didn't want to live there for that reason alone, you know. And he accepted my, and I did, I did have a, a trained shepherd, you know, that uh, thing, so anyway. So the excuse was good enough. Yeah, he, he bought into that one, you know, so... Uh, it must also have taken some discretion for, for you guys who worked for him as bodyguards and of course could see a lot of things, uh, especially the other ladies he had on tour when you came back to Greece and then Priscilla was waiting back home. Did you ever ask any of you guys, did you see somebody else uh, on the tour or...? 
was it just something she kept between her and Elvis? Well, when I'm between Priscilla and Elvis, when I'm between Priscilla and Elvis, I don't think it's my right or thing that I should make comments on. Well, well, what I meant was just if, if she ever asked you about what's going on. She never asked me. I don't know what she may have asked other people, but she never asked me. Yeah. Working for Elvis have been giving you a lot of uh, good times, I can feel that on you. But suddenly one day he passed away, unfortunately. What did you do after that, uh, after he passed away? Uh, you had to look for a new job, right? No, I actually, <coughs> when he passed away, I, uh, there were too many things that needed to be done. I didn't have time to even think. You know? There was no plan set up for this to happen. So we had to create a plan. And Sam Thompson and I, and, uh, we worked together to try to do things, you know, and uh, take care of uh, Vernon. And we had uh, Lisa Marie at Graceland, you know. So all of a sudden, everything changes. We're getting ready to go on tour, um, and that's now been canceled. You know? And it's like, what do you do? Well, first off, you secure uh, Graceland lock it down you know nobody can come in and go out well you know now you sit down and make a list of who can come in because there are certain people that need to come in and others you know. so we had to go through that kind of thing and uh, I sent down uh, his uh, his uncle uh, Fester who was on duty at the gate when this came down and so he's taken off now who do we put down there well Mike McGregor showed up there because he had been in and taking care of the horses at the time he was the one that took care of the horses and the leather and the animals and so I sent Mike McGregor down to the gate uh, to control open and close the main gate and uh, Gave him, we sent him down a list of who we thought needed to be coming and going. How fast were you called after they found out he was dead? And how fast did you arrive on the, on the place? Well, apparently, uh, the best I can say is that the ambulance was on its way out of Graceland heading to the hospital that I got to call to my house. And I had just gotten up because I had been with Elvis for about I'll well, say 11 o'clock the night before till about 5 in the morning when we were talking things about the tour that was coming up. So he'd be briefing, he'd like to, we got to go over that. Okay, you know, this we've played this city before, we're staying in the same hotel, you know. And, uh, but I get down there and, and uh, I'm there when uh, uh, Elvis has passed. The doctors put him, you know, said he's gone, and uh, took him to the morgue. Uh, and because uh, they had no security available, because the security, the word was already out that Delva, Elvis had gone to the hospital, not necessarily that he was dead, but fans were still now congregating around the, in a hospital security. They didn't have a whole lot. They were busy doing controlling crowds and uh, trying to keep the crowds out and news people out. And um, uh, when I took him to the morgue, I'm, I'm familiar with morgues. I've been in, you know, been a policeman. I've been around dead bodies. And the nurse was pushing the cart for me and everything. We get to the morgue door and open the door and push it in and I see this sheep going up and down, up and down. Now, dead people don't, sheep don't go up and down. So I pulled the sheet off and it was a paparazzi with his camera. And I very politely saw that he was escorted out of the morgue. And then I decided I better check the rest. 
and under one cart I found another paparazzi in there with his camera and then politely escorted him out. Unfortunately, I learned something about paparazzis. They all have slippery fingers and their cameras both hit the floor at different times and broke open. So any film that they had in there wasn't good anymore. And they also, paparazzis don't necessarily listen to somebody trying to escort them out, that the door opens inward and they ran right into it with their nose. I'm sorry they should have listened to me because I told them the door opened inward and they were escorted out and then walked off. But that's when then I, I went back up to the uh, administration of the hospital and I got a request for an autopsy to be done on Elvis's body. And if it was paid for by the family, it was private. If it was paid for by the county, it's public. So I took it back to Vernon, Ed Graceland, had it, him sign it, I witnessed it, Dr. Nick witnessed it, I took it back down, and Vernon wanted to know about it, you know, and I said, Vernon, trust me, you do this. He said, well, what's it cost? I said, about $390 or something. He said, don't worry, if, if you don't want to pay, I'll pay for it, but you don't want your son's remains and stuff exposed to the world like John F. Kennedy, the president's was. And he said, no, okay, you did, you know. And Dr. Nick told him to do it too, it was a good thing. So I took it back down to the hospital and that's why today it's not available to anybody. But we have seen some uh, thing coming out about Elvis today. Is that some, where, where did that come from then? Well, there are certain parts of that uh, autopsy that go outside the control of the people doing the autopsy. And you're probably talking about uh, different drugs that were in his yes. system. Uh, those were sent outside the lab. Those were not included in the actual autopsy, autopsy thing. They were part of it, but they were public. And in reality, if you look at those drugs, if you understand drugs, uh, certain drugs will remain in your body longer periods of time, trace amounts. Uh, others go like that, some stay alive. There were, and, and people like, they want to make a big thing about it. In reality, it's not a big thing because there were four different forensic toxicologists that examined those drugs and the amounts separately and unbeknownst to each other. They never talked about it. One of them was uh, the big coroner from Los Angeles, uh, Naomi I think his name was. He's done all the famous deaths of different stars and stuff there. The other one was uh, the coroner of Miami-Dade County, Miami, Florida. Another one, if I remember correctly, don't take this to the bank, but I think he was the coroner from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And the other one, the fourth one, I don't remember where he's from. But these were all four of the most knowledgeable, respected people in criminal toxicology to look at stuff like that. They said there was not one drug in there by itself that would kill anybody. No combination of any drugs in the thing would kill anybody. So Elvis did not die from the drugs that were in his system. They were there, but they were there for different reasons and for different time periods and over time periods. Basically, from what I know, uh, talk, uh, cholesterol was not a big thing that we talked about at that day. We Everybody knows it now. It's a bad thing from your blood vessels around your heart. Nobody knew about it then. His heart vessels were clogged 
with this. I wish nobody knew. Lee didn't test that. And why was that? He ate a southern diet, which was fried foods. And we now know if you eat too many fried foods, you get cholesterol in your system. Uh, and nobody knew he had it. Why? I don't know. I'm not the medical person that took care of it. But I know that that was a fact. And if you look at the other things that heart people say you should avoid, Elvis had every one of them except smoking and drinking. He had stress from many different areas. One that was this book that had just been released about him by his former friend. Uh, he's got this fight ongoing with Ginger. His dad is having problems with his then wife, which was his second wife, and Elvis's stepmother. And, uh, that's got him upset, you know. So he's got all these things. He's got this, plus he hadn't been exercising, you know. So all these things that are going to lead to a heart problem. Okay. And they were all there. They just all hit at the same time. And he was very worried about uh, this new tour uh, that was coming up or we were leaving for him because it's the first time he'd been out since this book had been written about him. And the book, you know, uh, was written by three security people that were terminated by Vernon, you know. Uh, and he didn't know what people were going to say about him because they wrote some very nasty thing and untrue things in the book. Uh, I never read the whole book. I've read parts of it. and. Having been there and working with these guys and knowing some other facts involved that they didn't bother to put in the book, and hey, I don't see any reason to. Uh, basically, they took like a grain of sand and they made a beach out of it from one grain of sand, you know. Uh, if you really look into it and go hardcore, you can start breaking it apart, but you have to have some common sense and understand certain things in life and, and you know, uh, Elvis just didn't, didn't do. He couldn't have taken all the pills that people say he, he took. And I know he didn't because you could not, it's like the government found out that, and I think the number is like about 10,000 pills were prescribed to Elvis that year. There's no way anybody could take 10 things. If you just use a little smarts, you know, you'd have to take one pill every minute for the time he was from the January to August. Nobody can do that. No. So, you know, if, if you start breaking it down and looking at it, uh, okay, if nobody can do that and still do what Elvis did, you know, there's got to be some other explanation. Well, people didn't know what the other is because we didn't give them the inter interviews, you know. So you think that he got a stroke because of the cholesterol and fall down there? Yes. Plus he had an uh, uh, over-enlarged heart, which doesn't help you, you know, and, and these things. So, yeah, he quite frankly died of what they call, I guess, cardiac arrhythmia. You know, and no matter how you look at it, if you really, it doesn't make for a good story. You know, it doesn't sell books, so they make other things into it. You know, that will bring money in. Dick, thank you very much. We could have talked for many hours, I think, but you also have other things to do while you're here in Ranas at Memphis Mainz. I know you have to go out and talk with the audience now. So thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. It was good talking to you. I, I enjoy myself here, and this has been one of the very best Elvis events that I have ever had the opportunity to attend. And what do you think about the copy of Elvis House? What do you think when... Paul this is about? fantastic. It really is. I, I can stand out in front of the house 
and almost see where Elvis might drive up and walk through the front door. It's a great adventure that I've had these last three days. Thank you very much. You got it. Welcome to my world Won't you come on in